they want to be producing domestically more high grade stuff more more contamination free yarns maybe more fine yarns while and so they will need that kind of cotton more so while on the yarn front they are trying to import almost all the yarn they import uh, largely as 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 a coarse count um, and so the key takeaway i would say here uh, especially from an opportunity perspective for india is that there is going to be a 3 million metric ton of cotton import demand from china consistently going forward and a 2 million metric ton demand of yarn so how does india make sure that it can um, it can do well uh, as far as the market share goes over there it's got to be relatively cheap because as you saw um, there is just going to be a lot of cotton available uh, especially the kind that that us and brazil and 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 australia are going to produce and the kind that china really likes uh, china really wants uh, to compete against that india will need to be really relatively speaking cheap uh, as far as cotton goes and as far as yarn is concerned there will be continuous competition from vietnam and pakistan largely especially next year we believe that pakistan um, could really produce a, a decent crop after all uh, finally uh, because we we believe that uh, there is there is a good likelihood that uh, area under cotton uh, increases substantially in pakistan so you could have a lot of cheap cotton available for pakistan who could uh, who could be much more competitive um, on the on the yarn front that's it get stuck to the 15 minutes thank you so for that highly informative session now i would like to invite atul ganatra president cotton association of india to kindly come on stage and give the suvin ratna to mr shah May I now invite Dr. Christian Schindler, Director General, International Textile Manufacturers Federation, to kindly come on stage and share his views with all of us. Oh, only, I thought 20. Now 16. Thank you very much uh, for this kind uh, introduction. Um, thank you very much to the Cotton Association of India um, under the leadership of President uh, Ganatra and his colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for being back in India. Um, we have heard a lot um, during the last two days. Um, I tried to give um, a feeling of what is happening on a global scale. Um, looking at uh, both the consumer markets, some industrial trends that are all affecting, of course, uh, in the end, the cotton industry and the cotton um, textile value chain. Um, the title of the presentation is The Geography of Textile Industry, Evolution of Trends. Um, uh, why this title? Because uh, every year we publish our textile machinery shipment statistics, not only on ring spindles and rotors, but also on texturing spindles, weaving uh, looms and knitting machines, as well as finishing machines. And this gives um, a good overview of trends in the whole textile uh, value chain that is, of course, also important to see um, for the fiber um, industry. The situation, well, I, I like to always start with um, textile exports and later on apparel exports um, since the 1980s and just to give uh, a feeling of what has happened in the last um, almost 20 years. Obviously, trade has exploded and you can see that um, we have some 
countries or regions that have done uh, really well in the last uh, 30 and uh, 40 years. Um, one of the big um, winners, um, trade winners, is of course uh, China, um, but also India and lately Vietnam and Bangladesh um, have um, performed really well. You see on the lower um, part of the graph, you see um, since the year 2000 how much um, trade has multiplied, um, especially in Vietnam and uh, China, but also Bangladesh um, and um, underperforming in comparison um, India to some extent. The same is true for clothing exports. Um, the same kind of ratios um, when it comes to um, who has benefited most um, during this uh, period. Again, China, um, since the year 2000, um, uh, increased its share from a relatively large base already, uh, 4%. Lately, especially Vietnam and Bangladesh have outperformed um, everybody else. When we look at uh, the final destinations um, of um, our products that we are producing as an industry, um, I, I always like to highlight um, that at the moment, maybe still the Western uh, regions, the Canada, uh, US, uh, Europe, are still um, very important and uh, very relevant, obviously, for exports. Um, but uh, we can see already that the largest apparel market, as we speak of, last year already uh, was China um, and this will only increase in the next few years as you can see uh, from from this table on the uh, left hand side and on the graph on the right hand side you see that the the share of the G7 countries will will um, come down to 23 percent as um, opposed to the emerging um, seven biggest countries that will uh, represent 50% by 2050. So the message here is obviously the markets in Asia, the end consumer markets are becoming more and more important, including of course India that is growing at a rate of, of 11%, um, outperforming um, everybody else, obviously from a much lower base, but very promising um, um, for the future um, as a consumer market. It's also interesting um, how the consumers are um, getting to their products. Um, I'm um, differentiating here between store-based retailing and online retailing. Uh, you see everybody, uh, everywhere you have the red, the red um, um, colors, which means that store-based retailing is losing um, share to, to online um, purchases. Um, um, that is um, true with the exception of India that still has to catch up in, in retailing um, and in some other Asian countries, uh, Vietnam or Indonesia, where you still have some, some growth, um, but it's losing on a global scale 2% um, between 2012 and 2017. In all the other countries, and this is um, the picture for internet retailing, um, we see also uh, internet uh, retailing increasing. So in some countries it's increasing in both areas like India, but in most country only retail, internet retailing is um, gaining and especially China um, that really is a leader in internet uh, retailing due to the application uh, and um, widespread um, use of uh, technology, um, especially on um, mobile uh, devices. That's important to know, and while I say that, at the same time, it's important to know that um, retail, um, brick and mortar uh, retailing, is still the bulk of retail, representing from area to area, it's a different number, but around 80% of retail. Um, competition drives price uh, strategy. Uh, this is an interesting uh, slide I, I wanted to share um, demonstrating um, the, the, the problems bro uh, brick and mortar retailing faces, um, especially those um, um, uh, brick and mortar retailers are having problems that are not in the fast fashion industry that have um, a lot of stocks um, 
and uh, long lead uh, time to market like the department stores who really have to discount a lot of their prop, uh, products um, as you can see 73% in 2016 whereas fast fashion producers uh, brands um, have a much lower um, uh, sale um, ratio compared to the other categories. Our industry is obviously a, a very competitive, um, has, uh, is acting in a very competitive nature and is driven by technological evolution and this is going on ever since this industry evolved um, a few hundred years back. It's always about being faster, less labor intensive, less energy intensive, less water intensive. Um, that's um, normal business. Um, and we have seen that especially in, in the spinning industry where, uh, for example, energy consumption uh, is playing um, an important role, whether it's in ring spinning, but especially in rotor spinning, where energy consumption um, uh, per product of um, kilogram of yarn really has come down by over 60% in rotor spinning over um, the last uh, 30 um, years, roughly. Um, that's um, another example of um, how costs play an important role um, um, from our um, international production cost comparison that we do. And that's actually data that is going to be published only uh, next week. Um,